We had the uh, charge d'affaires of uh, Venezuela to the United States. He should be the ambassador, um, except for the diplomatic uh, tension between the two countries right now. Hopefully he'll be ambassador shortly. Um, he came to speak on why Venezuela is not a threat to the United States, but why it offers a hope uh, to the world. For nearly 10 years, almost 10 years, I've been very lucky and privileged to work closely to President Chavez. Um, and then in 2010, I was appointed as ambassador in Brazil. I worked there for three years. Um, but I mentioned that because, yes, I was privileged to, to be a witness and to follow all the changes that have been taking place in Latin America for the last 10 years or 15 years, since 1999. All this process, all the changes for the better that took place in our continent. Um, then I, so I was in Brazil for three years, and then French Chavez passed away in 2013, and I went back to Caracas to, to work with uh, President Maduro. And then last year, I still remember, I was having a conversation with my president, and we were talking about the United States and how important, you know, that we start to improve the relations and find the right balance in our conversation with the United States. And we're thinking, OK, we should do something about it. And then a couple of days later, um, I receive a phone call from my president. He told me, oh, Maximilian, I've been thinking, I think you should go there. So I said, OK. Uh, so usually, our diplomats, when we go to the United States, they, they don't stay very long. you know. Um, so I said, OK, it's going to be a challenge. Um, so I arrived here in July last year. And, uh, and I can tell you that being not an easy job for the last eight, nine months. But then one day I woke up and I read in the news that my country, Venezuela, has become a national threat to the United States. It is something, you know. Wow. Then I start to look at the list of the countries that being, as well, designed, I mean, um, shown as national trade to the United States. And I think there's nine or 10 countries, I think. And uh, usually, it doesn't end, end very well for those countries. Um, so I was thinking, wow, I represent a national trade to the United States. Um, and I always thought to myself, but no, Venezuela is hope. We are trying to build something different, you know? Um, but then, yes, I have to say that a few weeks later, a couple of, few weeks later, yeah, a couple of days before the summit of Panama, you know, that was in, uh, in April. Have you, have you been following what took place in Panama? That it was the first real summit of the Americas, of America, because we were all invited, including Cuba, for the first time. Um, it was a big event. And also, it was very interesting to see that almost all the presidents that took part of the, of the summit, they all said to President Obama, come on, Venezuela it can't be a threat to the United States. I have to say that a couple of days before the summit, actually, President Obama did recognize that Venezuela was not a threat. We need to take into account that. So a few headlines that you might never heard about Venezuela, or you might never read about Venezuela in the mainstream media, even in my country. Illiteracy was eradicated in Venezuela. Extreme poverty was cut in half to 5% while poverty fell to 25%. 95% of Venezuelan people today eat three times per day. Today, Venezuela has the second highest college enrollment in the region. Uh, housing increased by 40%. 
The number of senior citizens receiving pensions more than tripled. Social investment increased to about a two-third of government spending. But yes, we do believe that we are a threat. We have in 15 years more than 19 elections. Every year there's an election in Venezuela. And we're going to have a new election before the end of this year, parliament elections. Last year we have... Um, uh, uh, local elections, yeah. Um, then the year before, we have presidential elections, governor elections, again, presidential elections, bec because when Prince Chavez was elected. I mean, you know, every year, it is a problem sometimes to govern, you know, because every year we get elections, you need to mobilize, to work. But yeah, we never talk about that, about all these things in Venezuela. When I arrived here in the United States, I've been doing some research. How can, I explain, how can I explain to my friends here about what's going on in Venezuela? And I, I think to some extent, it's a combination with uh, the New Deal, you know, President Roosevelt in the 30s, last century, economic and social inclusion, is what, we did, what we've been trying to do in Venezuela. And also, to some extent, the civil rights movement in the 60s, also from last century. Um, political inclusion. So I believe that what took place in Venezuela, what is taking place in Venezuela for the last 10 years, is a combination of these two historical movements that you've been through here in this amazing country. Civil rights movement. For the first time in Venezuela, you have the vast majority of our people that before they were regarded as second-rank citizens, that suddenly now they have become full citizens with rights, but also duties and obligations. And nowadays, when, if you have the opportunity to go to Venezuela, you will find an amazing society where all the sectors of the population, higher, middle, lower classes, working classes, everybody is engaged, committed, talking about politics. You know, when you think that in our last local elections, more, the turnout was more than, was around 80% to elect a mayor, you know? 80% people <coughs> get mobilized. And I'm saying that because in Venezuela, it is not um, compulsory to go to vote. You know, there are two Venezuela, one virtual, particularly in the internet, and in the mainstream media, and the real Venezuela when you go there. And that's quite, impo that's quite amazing, you know, that these two different Venezuela. And um, yes, for the first time, you got some of sectors of the Venezuelan pop population that they get access to the media that not only, not the media, not, not, they don't talk only about one sector of the population, but they talk about all the Venezuelan society. Um, another point, regaining sovereignty. You know, thanks to the Bolivar Bolivarian Revolution, we've been able to rediscover our nation. Where do we come from? Prince Chavez was a wonderful teacher a wonderful pedagogue. He was an, histo an historian. And what always amazed me from him that he was able to look the past and our history in order to move forward. That was very important. And I think this, this idea to rediscover the nation, it was being characterized most of the process that had been taking place in Latin America in the last 10 years. Not only in Venezuela, but in Ecuador, in Bolivia, to some extent in Brazil, in Argentina. You know, people start to be proud of our history and where we come from. That's something that I believe Prince Chavez was one of the first to show us that. Um, and because I mentioned this idea of Bolivar, obviously another very important concept that we've been fighting for and promoting is the idea of regional integration and solidarity. When you imagine where, how was Venezuela and Latin America 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and where we are now, 
We got UNASUR, CELAC, MERCOSUR, you know, ALBA, PETROCARIBE. And I have to say that most of these important new forum or um, regional um, bodies, Venezuela was one of the key players on their creation, on their um, promotion. So that's something qu qu quite new. And I believe that's one of the reasons why, for example, when President Baba goes to Panama, well, you have to listen all these presidents showing solidarity to Venezuela and seeing this continent has changed. You know? Obviously, we are all very pleased about what's taking place right now between the United States and Cuba. You know? It's very important. But we believe that also that's a result of all the changes that have been taking place in our continent in the last 10, 15 years. As I've been saying, that we've been through an important social transformation and political as well in Venezuela. And what is important that there's elections, as I said, every year. But a bit like during the civil rights movement here, you, know, you have some sectors of the society, of the population, that for them is very difficult to accept this kind of change and to realize that, yes, you've got also a vast majority of the people that want to be part of the society. And sometimes you got a kind of violent reaction with that. Um, so, you know, in 2002, you had a coup against my government, against Prince Chavez, that did last only for two days. That was on, in April 2002. And thanks to an amazing mobil mobilization from the army and from the people, Prince Chavez was back. Um, and from time to time, you got some people that, you know, they cannot accept the result of the polls, the result of the elections, and they try something, you know. So, for example, last year, we went through a very difficult moment. A couple of months after his death, we have a, a presidential elections. President Maduro was elected. Um, it was a difficult election because we were all, um, you know, recovering uh, from the death of from Chavez. Um, it was a, a difficult moment for, for the Venezuelans, for my country. And, uh, and when you go to election, usually you go, you know, with a kind of sp fighting spirit, you know, and kind of, but, you know, we were, um, yes, recovering, you know, in, in Luto. Um, and then, so the result was, again, Maduro was elected with, I think, 51% of the vote against 49. The kind of result you will find in any European country, for example, but because it is Venezuela, so, oh my God, something fishy took place there, you know? But okay. And then six months later, in December 2013, we have the election for mayors, local elections. Uh, it's very interesting because at that moment, the Venezuelan opposition decided to transform that local election as a kind of national referendum. This time we're gonna show to the people, to the world that yes, we have the majority. So the election took place in December, and again, huge participation, more than 80%, and the result was 55% of the votes for the PSUV, the party of the Bolivian Revolution, and 45 for the opposition. And now I don't know how, I don't have the numbers of towns and cities that, but a large majority went through the party of President Maduro. Um, so again, an important result. And, um, and yes, okay, result of the election, that, that's democracy. Few weeks later, a few days later, the result, 
we have an important meeting that took place in Caracas with President Maduro, <coughs> where he invited all the, all the new elected mayor, including from the opposition. <coughs> I was at that meeting, actually, a very interesting meeting where President Maduro said, OK, we've got our differences, but let's try to move on and identify areas where we can work together. Because you know, it is, we've got some problems, that's true, and we need to work all together to resolve them. So that was in December 2013. And then, a few weeks later, suddenly, you have a little tiny group of people from the opposition that decided to go to the street of Caracas, and they decided to stay, to stay there until my government resigned. This event took place mainly in the higher, upper classes, middle classes, you know, of Caracas and other places of Venezuela. Um, they were described by the mainstream media as uh, student protest. <coughs> it was very interesting because I was, I was in Caracas at that moment, and obviously everybody was talking about Kiev in Ukraine and all these events that had been taking place before in Egypt. And you know, so as soon as you got a group of people gathering in a square, they think, oh, a revolution is taking place there, and the government must be very bad. Um, but yes, but that was not exactly the case in Venezuela, because this demonstration was not exactly led by peaceful student. And uh, it was very easy to see that something, something else was going on at that moment. And yes. A coup was on his way in Venezuela during these days. An attempt to destabilize the normal, the, a government, an attempt to show to the world, look at this government that is repressing all these peaceful students. The point that there was really an attempt to overthrow a legitimate and democratic government. How come? Well, when you think they targeted only public um, offices. They started to interrupt the validity of the street of Caracas and quite in quite a violent manner. And unfortunately, 43 Venezuelan citizens died during these weeks. But including 10 members of the armed forces or security officers. I think that if something like that could, might take place in any country in the world, including here, obviously the state will react and make sure that the citizen can have a normal life and not to be interrupted and disrupted by a minority of people. And that was, that's, that's what we did. And these 43 people who die, some of them if, including, they have nothing to do with the demonstrations or whatever. And uh, we all feel very sorry for them. Very sad moment. And yes, you have a couple, few leaders, political leaders, that were involved in that coup. And now we have to respond to the Venezuelan justice. Right now, I'm speak as I'm speaking, you got a couple of women that were in Washington, D.C., and they just received an award from the NED, a kind of prize to fight for democracy and for. And one of these ladies, her husband, is was one of the main leaders of this coup last year. I prefer President Maduro to receive an award from the World Food Organization than from the NED. Um, I should mention that more than 3,000 people were arrested during these um, riots or whatever we call that, during this, this coup. And right now, only 39 people are still in jail. 
And from these 39 people, half of them, they belong to the police or to the armed forces or to the National Guard. Half of them. And there's only one person that we could say is a student. <laughs> yes. But again, you will never see that in the New York Times. When you look at our history and where, we do, where do we come from, you have to remember, for example, in Venezuela, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, all the violations of human rights that took place. In 1989, you have what we call the Caracaso, February 89. I believe that more than 5,000 people were disappear, were killed, and most of them by damn forces. And you didn't have any sanction build against Venezuela at that moment. You didn't have any executive order against Venezuela at that moment. You know? Where we are now? Obviously, we are going through uh, some difficult moment. Venezuela is an oil producer country. Nobody could have imagined six months ago, eight months ago, that the price of the barrel of oil will drop from $100 to $40. That's something, you know. Um, not a good moment to be a president or to govern a country that, you know, uh, needs its main income. Because that's the truth, you know, Venezuela is an oil producer. There's nothing we can do about it, you know. Um, so, yes, yeah, so a difficult moment, but he obliged us to diversify our economy and to be more, let's say, creative. This coming Sunday, on the 17th of May, our opposition, we're going to have their, what do you say, primaries? Um, and we are very pleased about that because they ask our electoral body to organize them. So again, when you read the press and we read, you see the mainstream media, they always say that in Venezuela, you know, we cannot trust the, the electoral body, the, the, the court, the justice. And, but yeah, it was, you see, it seems that the Venezuelan opposition sometimes they, tr they, be, they, they you know, for them, um, our electoral body is good only when we, when we win elections, no, not when we lose. I mean, but so, but it's a good example for democracy. The fact that you know primaries will take place, and uh, those who identify themselves with the Venezuelan position will have, we, we, they're going to be able to elect their candidate for the next elections, and the PSUV, the party of the of the revolution, I think they're going to have a primaries in, Jul in June, July. And, uh, and again, yeah, we will have elections um, for the end of the, the year. And uh, we are taking some important measure because we are confronting uh, some difficult moment on the economic front, as I said before, $100, $40, you know. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, to and also, one thing I didn't mention that, yes, we went through uh, also a kind of sabotage of our economy. For those who know history, remember what took place in Chile in the early 70s before the coup, you know, to create havoc, chaos, shortages, you know, with this idea that, um, you can identify a socialist country because there's a lot of queue there. Well, it's not exactly that. And definitely you got sectors of the economic, of the sectors that being working against my government, promoting all these shortages and all this disarray. But we are fighting that. And, um, and things are improving. And we believe that in the next few months, we've managed to stabilize the situation. Um, I should mention that 
that Venezuela also has been an important player, as I said, to promote solidarity and integration in all the region. We mentioned Petrocaribe, for example, very important for all our brothers from Haiti and Dominican Republic, Jamaica, you know, and also for Central America. El Salvador judged on Petrocaribe last year, very important. Um, as you know, some important peace talks are taking place in Colombia right now. And again, Venezuela uh, is very, you know, we, we, we are following closely what's taking place there. If everything goes well, we might have um, a continent free of any armed conflict. Very important. Um, and um, for those who think that promoting this stability in Venezuela, you will have something better, just imagine all the changes that have been taking place in my country. If we don't resolve our differences through election, through democratic manners, it will be a chaos. It will be very dangerous, not only for Venezuela, but for most of the region. So, yeah, interesting times. I'm very pleased to see that you are interesting of what's taking place in my country. But I would like to thank you, Professor Lee, Felix as well, Professor Felix, um, Stanfield Smith, our consul, Jesus, has been helping me to promote this event. And let's hope next time when I come back, we're going to have a microphone. Because <laughs> I'm losing my voice right now. Um, don't be surprised about my French accent, because I, was grow I grew up in France. So it's where I get this silly accent um, when I was a teenager. And uh, any question, whatever you want to know about my country, I'm here to respond to you. Thank you.